Welcome to Episode 2 of The Strange and Interesting Podcast, a podcast about folklore, the paranormal, urban legends, and pretty much anything else that I happen to find strange and interesting. I am your host, Al. Let me start this episode by saying, mental illness sucks. And if you follow any podcasts or TV series about mental illness, morbid topics, or haunted history, you are probably aware that the only thing that sucks more than having a mental illness is how these ailments used to be treated. There was once a time when a person suspected of having a mental disorder would be subjected to treatments such as ice water baths, electroshock therapy, lobotomies, induced comas, and forced isolation. To say this treatment was inhumane is a bit of an understatement, and some of these treatments may have done more harm than good. Fortunately, treatments for mental illness have become more humane over the years. No doubt there are people who could benefit from medication and professional help, but mental health care is not available to everyone. Sadly, even if mental health services were more affordable, there is a tendency in Western culture to stigmatize it. There used to be the threat of sending someone to an asylum, These places were often called a variety of unflattering names, like the Funny Farm, the Madhouse, or the Looney Bin. I would like to think we have become more empathetic towards those who suffer from mental illness, but this isn't always the case. Today, a person suffering from anxiety might be told that they're just overreacting, a person suffering from depression will inevitably be told that they should just cheer up because surely things aren't that bad. A person suffering from any other disorder might be told that it's all in their head or that they should just suck it up and tough it out. Well, some people who throw out these phrases might have good intentions and think they are helping it is more likely their efforts will prove unhelpful. Since antiquity, we have come up with a variety of explanations for mental illness. Various disorders have been blamed on witchcraft, attributed to divine punishment, thought to be the result of demonic possession, or caused by an imbalance of substances within the body called humors. Before modern medicine, treatments could include talismans that were believed to protect from black magic, trepanning, which is drilling a hole in the skull, trying to balance out substances within the body by consuming certain foods, or undergoing a purification ritual. The ancient Egyptians had a more progressive approach. Egyptian texts prescribe having the afflicted partake in activities like painting, music, and dancing. Whether these treatments worked or not is up to debate. But what about those individuals who did not respond to attempts to help them? This leads us to today's topic. Throughout history, civilizations had to figure out what to do with the mentally ill who were unable to care for themselves and the mentally ill who were potentially dangerous towards others. This led to the development of mental asylums. These institutions started out as a place to keep these individuals apart from society, but eventually they turned their efforts to the study and treatment of mental illness. One such institution used to exist in my area. It opened in 1890 and was called the Outagamie County Asylum for the Chronic Insane 
and later the Outagamy County Hospital. Before we begin, I want to note that the name of this episode comes from a video I saw on YouTube called Ash's Adventures. A lady was trying to record EVPs in the cemetery. I don't know if the Meadow of Forgotten Souls is a name she made up or if she got it from another source, but it sounded cool and I thought it would be a good name for this episode. Our story begins in 1889 when the county board purchased several hundred acres of land in the city of Appleton for the purpose of building an asylum. Even back then, there was somewhat of a sense of disdain for the mentally ill, and it was common for the people living here to be referred to as inmates as opposed to patients. A person could be admitted here for a variety of reasons not directly related to mental illness, like postpartum depression, alcoholism, or extreme poverty. A person might also be dropped off if they were ill and their family was unable to care for them. For most patients admitted to the asylum, it was a one-way trip. Once they checked in, the only way out was usually in a casket. The first superintendent of the asylum was a man named George Downer. He did not have a background in mental health and instead had a background in agriculture. Perhaps he was selected for this role because the property included a farm. The goal was to make the asylum self-sufficient and by all accounts, it succeeded in this goal. The farm grew food for the patients and extra products were sold to the community. By 1895, the asylum made a profit of $9,000, which would be over $200,000 in 2022. Despite this profit, the management was very budget conscious. And if you have listened to podcasts dealing with the history of mental illness you can probably guess where this is going. The asylum only employed 10 to 20 people per year through most of its history. The majority of the work around the institution was performed by the patients, including cooking, cleaning, and working on the farm. The asylum didn't even have full-time medical professionals, instead relying on visits from traveling doctors. This lack of on-site medical staff and overcrowding meant a patient could go for weeks or even months without seeing a real doctor. We know electroshock therapy was one of the treatments used by the asylum, and the staff members who administered it were rarely properly trained in the procedure. Day-to-day life in the asylum depended on the patient's physical and mental fitness. Those who were deemed able-bodied spent long hours working on the farm with only three meal breaks and occasional periods of entertainment. Patients who were deemed not fit to work spent most of their time in bed or day rooms with little to do. Things began to go downhill for the asylum in 1913. One of the patients, a father of six named John Rayfelt, was forced to go through involuntary sterilization. He was not alone, and while several other men were forced to go through the same procedure, Rayfelt's family is the only one known to have filed a lawsuit. The castration was performed by Dr. James Canavan at the recommendation of George Downer. Sadly, the case would never go to court. Dr. Canavan died on December 4, 1913. Downer resigned in 1914, and in 1915, he committed suicide 
by jumping off the Law Street Bridge. Rayfelt was released and returned to his family, but was unable to put his life back together again. His wife filed for divorce. By 1915, he was back at the asylum, and he died in 1931. George Downer's position was filled by Thomas Flanagan and his wife, Anna. Like his predecessor, he had no experience in the mental health field. The asylum came to be called Flanagan's Funny Farm by some of the locals. In 1944, an inspection and review of the asylum found that the facility was overcrowded. They had added 100 additional patients but had fewer staff on hand to take care of them. Each room would house anywhere from 11 to 14 people, and many of the patients were malnourished. Management, ever more concerned with the budget than helping the patients, had been withholding food so they would have more to sell. There were also reports of the hospital staff physically abusing the patients and allegations of ethics violations. The Flanagans retired, and the asylum management once again changed hands. Something needed to be done, as by 1956, the 150-bed facility housed over 260 patients. The county invested close to $2 million in expanding the asylum. More rooms were added, and the maximum occupancy per room was limited to four. By 1966, most of the farming equipment was sold off. The name was changed to Outagamie County Hospital, though this name would not stick. Some of the local residents thought the center was actually a normal hospital, and people came here for help with any medical need. So to help avoid confusion, the name was later changed to Outagamie County Health Center. The asylum closed in 2000 with the opening of a new assisted living center, and the last remaining buildings were demolished in 2001. Today, the only things left from this forgotten piece of Wisconsin history are a stone bridge and a cemetery. The moniker Meadow of Forgotten Souls is an appropriate one. If the body of a dead patient was not claimed by the family, it was buried in this field, usually without a headstone. The daughter of a couple who used to work at the asylum mentioned in an interview with the Appleton Post Crescent newspaper that there used to be an iron fence around the cemetery, though it may have been removed during World War II, possibly during a scrap metal drive so it could be used for the war effort. There were headstones for some of the graves, but most were removed in the 1940s. The last headstone was removed in the 1970s. 20 years later, the plot of land was overgrown and forgotten. There were talks of building a road through this site, but an Outagamie County executive heard about this plan and put a stop to it. His father had worked on the farm and he realized there were graves in the area. Restoration work on the cemetery wouldn't take place until 2013 when a local organization called Agape of Appleton organized the Friends of Outagamie County Cemetery. In 2014, anthropology students from a local college, Lawrence University, scanned the grounds to determine where the graves were located. The students from Fox Valley Technical College also helped with some of the restoration efforts, including building a path and a pergola. After two years of fundraising and hard work, they made the cemetery what it is today, a place where people who were once cast out of society to be forgotten could finally be remembered. If you are ever in the Appleton area, you can visit the cemetery by following the road past Brewster Village. On the way, you will pass by a large empty field. This is where the asylum once stood. 
Tucked away in the back is a sign marking the cemetery and the old stone bridge trail. As you walk through the woods, you will pass by three signs describing the history of the asylum before you arrive at the cemetery itself. A granite monument stands at the entrance with the names of people who are known to have been buried there. There are no tombstones, but there are markers indicating the location of the burial rows. And with that, we will end this episode of the Strange and Interesting Podcast. While writing this episode, I visited the cemetery, and if you are interested, you can view the video of my visit on Point of Insanity Game Studios' YouTube channel. Thank you for listening, and until next time, stay strange and stay interesting. The Strange and Interesting Podcast is a presentation of Point of Insanity Game Studio and the Eclectic Media Project. Look us up on Facebook and Anchor.fm.